Chag Sameach. My name is Debbie Rothstein, president of Beth Sedek Congregation, and I'm thrilled to welcome you to our Pesach supplement. Our family seders have always been large and loud. For as long as I can remember, we have begun our seders singing the order of the seder. Kadesh, Urachatz, Karpas, Yachatz. That first aspect in the order of the seder, Kadesh, brought silence to the table and a focus on what we as a family and Jews around the world were about to embark upon. While we sing Kiddush together every Shabbat, this Kiddush, this Kadesh, is different. The order of the Seder has such familiarity and a sense of routine, but the Kiddush at our Seders has always elicited feelings of anticipation as to what we are about to begin and how we are also a chapter in the history of the Seder. On behalf of Michael, Emma, and Zach, and the extended Rothstein and Friedman families, I wish you and your family a Chag Pesach Kasher B'Sameach. And now, we finish the first cup of wine. It's time for Or Chatz. Happy birthday to you, happy birthday to you, happy birthday dear Akiva, happy birthday to you, Feliz cumpleaños a tu, Feliz cumpleaños a tu, Feliz cumpleaños a tu, Feliz cumpleaños a tu, Yomulet et Sameach, Yomulet et Sameach, and you know the special thing about Urchat? No bracha! Shalom. Thanks for joining us. I want to share a little bit with you about karpas. Karpas is a Greek word, one of the two Greek words that inhabit our Seder. One at the end, afikomen, which refers to the after dinner partying um, or the after dinner carousing or the running from one home to another. Uh, and the other, karpas, which means something that grows from the soil. Um, karpas represents the spring. In fact, there's a bracha to be recited during the month of Nisan when you see trees in bloom. There's something special about the springtime, the sense of hope and of possibility. For us, Karpas was always growing up a potato. It was something that came out of my mother's Polish experience. I think sometimes of Van Gogh's uh, painting, The Potato Eaters, where uh, peasants are seated around a table and eating potatoes. I think of Holocaust images and stories of people in death camps and in ghettos who ate potatoes for their primary sustenance. Um, thankfully, I'm privileged, and probably you are as well, to have more than that as part of your Pesach Seder. Uh, of course, in North America, it's ubiquitous to have parsley, but even though the idea is that you don't take a lot of food, you don't overindulge because the, this is the, like the appetizer and you want to have room for the matzah, which is the essential part of the Seder for us. Um, even though you don't want to indulge, I encourage people to nibble through the first part of the Seder. Um, and that, of course, is good for kids as well. Um, but it enables us to, to enter um, and, and take a little more time for discussion at the first part of the Seder. In our Seder, we're very privileged to be able to not only have potatoes and parsley, um, carrots and celery, uh, but asparagus and broccoli, um, which in the old days I used to associate with springtime. Um, and we keep in mind that we're going to have maror later. Maror is also uh, something that grows from the earth. For us, maror is not horseradish, but rather it's romaine lettuce, it's uh, Belgian endive, 
um, its artichokes. Uh, these are ways of marking the springtime in a time prior to the u ubiquitous um, vegetables that we get throughout the winter that come from South America. Um, there were vegetables that were particularly characteristic of spring, whether an early spring or a later spring. Um, but I go back to the potato. I go back and I ask, um, what sustained my, our ancestors um, when they faced difficult times? What food was there um, that represented to them sustenance? And I want to ask you, there may have been times in your own life where you've had to face difficult times. And sometimes we have food that we associate with sustaining ourselves when we're vulnerable. For some, it may just be comfort food, but for others, it may be something more. What sustained you as you face difficult times? Now we're privileged on Pesach to have more times for celebration. And I hope that this year, despite the COVID pandemic restrictions, I hope that you'll be blessed with a wonderful Pesach, Pesach full of hope and promise. Shalom. Hi, I'm happy to share with you a couple of thoughts about Yachatz, the breaking of the middle matzah this year as we get ready to celebrate Passover and our Starim, our Seders. I happen to have uh, behind me an image of Shmura Matzah. Yes, it's true, I do like cardboard, especially for Pesach. I'm a big Shmura Matzah person. When it comes for Yachatz, uh, we take three matzot and we uh, put them underneath the matzah cover. Um, three, there's a couple of reasons for this. Uh, some say it's uh, to represent uh, the three tribes or the three surviving tribes of Israel, the Kohanim, the priests, the Vidim, um, also the priests, and the Yisrael, the, the rest of us. Uh, some say three is also the number of intent. Uh, when something happens by once, it might be an accident, two might be a coincidence, but three times you intend to do something. Some say that perhaps it represents uh, time past, present, and the future. Uh, regardless, we have three matzot. And for yachatz, we take the middle matzah and we break it in half. Now, the larger half of that we then hide as the afikonim. And the smaller half, uh, then we basically declare in the next page, halach ma'anya, this is the bread of affliction. Now, why do we do that? Why do we break the middle matzah? Now, there are a lot of reasons for it. And the ones that resonate most uh, specially and purposefully with me um, have to do with an understanding that the world is broken. The world is broken and redemption is, is something that we have to seek after. It's not something that we can expect to happen just by the grace of God. In fact, the Talmud says, don't rely on miracles uh, to be your savior, to redeem you. You have to do something, you have to work, you have to seek out redemption in order for redemption to occur. Um, we recite something similar to these ideas uh, in our Sidor on Friday nights, the Sidor Sim Shalom, page 32 below the line, both sides. Um, daily God renews us and gives us the ability for redemption. And then also that interpretive piece by Martin Buber that talks about how a person can't seek redemption until we um, face the flaws in ourselves and seek to efface them, nor can a people face redemption until they see the flaws in themselves, the broken pieces in themselves and seek to efface them. Uh, it's interesting, as I'm recording this, it's the week of Parshat Ki Tisa, which is also about broken, broken tablets. Uh, Moses sees the golden calf, breaks the tablets, goes up to Mount Sinai and receives a new set. But the broken tablets still are carried in the Aron Ha'ark. You can't move forward, you can't progress forward without having your broken pieces with you. Um, we seek to rebuild them, or we at least, at the very least, we seek to, to hold them. Uh, but they are part of who we are. Our brokenness is part of who we are. And when we can learn to, to carry them such that the weight is not too much, uh, that's one of the ways in which we seek redemption. So the Afikomen, is our future, it's our future for the, it's our future, hope for the future. And maybe that's one of the reasons why we have the kids look for it. 
uh, because the kids ultimately represent their hope for the future. They represent uh, a new opportunity uh, to be better than we were. And that's what all of us as parents want is we want our kids to surpass us, to be smarter, more healthy in a better world. Um, but for them to have that, that means that we too have to work forward towards that Afikam. And so Yachatz, um, at the beginning of the Seder, um, is a reminder of the unity of people. It's a reminder of the potentiality of what we're about to achieve here. It's a reminder that we are all broken in some way, shape, or form, and that redemption only comes when we seek to efface um, that brokenness and we seek out uh, the possibility for redemption. One last thought, that the other pizza matzah, the halach ma'anya, uh, redemption comes also when we're not so self-centered. Uh, but we remember that there are people in the world um, that have less than we do and that we open our doors uh, to welcome them both physically and symbolically um, to eat from our table. Halach uh, ma'anya, maybe that's another way in which redemption is achieved uh, when we can reach out and help those that are less fortunate than us. Uh, sometimes actually through volunteerism and sometimes, uh, yeah, by writing a check and making sure that those agencies that help people who are in need, people who are hungry, uh, find food to eat. Um, these are the many ways by which we move forward to find that hidden redemption. Hopefully we'll find it soon. Next year, may we be together uh, in Jerusalem, but in our homes, around our Seder tables, uh, telling the stories of redemption over these two years um, all the kindnesses that helped us get through the pandemic um, and all the um, acts that we did that gave ourselves and those around us hope. Chag Sameach. Bye-bye. Hi, I'm Rabbi Fryer Bodzin, and I'm delighted to share with you some tricks about Magid, which is by far the largest part of our Pesach Seder. When I was a little girl, our seders were wonderful and I loved them, but it consisted of my extended family going around the table reading paragraphs from the yellow and orange Haggadah. As I got older, I learned that the Magid section is the place where there is the most creativity. For example, you might want to put frogs on your table. This particular frog joined our seder about three years ago and it has graced our seder tables every year. Or perhaps you might want to actually prepare in advance. This is the Haggadah that we use in our family when we host seders. And what my husband Aaron and I do is we find a moment when we're not cooking and cleaning and baking and getting ready for the holiday to actually pick out which pieces we're going to focus on. Maybe this year we'll focus on the four children. Maybe this year we'll focus on Dayenu, because really we've had a lot of Dayenu moments. Or maybe this year we'll bring in readings from outside the Haggadah that speak about the experience of slavery. Telling the story means telling the story, the story from slavery to freedom. And Aaron and Ariel and I hope that you have a wonderful, wonderful Pesach next year, please God, at tables full of our families and friends. Chag Kasher V'Sameach. Hello, I'm Cantor Sidney Ezer. Rochza, the ritual hand washing just prior to reciting the blessing over the matzah. Although technically the verb rachatz with the root letters resh, chet, and sadi, meaning to wash or to bathe, would make the most sense, our rabbis in general chose a much less common word for hand washing, which was nitila. So why not use that word here instead of rochza? Someone suggested that the word nitila would be associated with washing with a blessing. So urchatz was chosen to make the distinction where we wash without reciting a blessing. This suggestion, however, would again intensify the question, why have rochza? The same root word as urchatz for washing with a blessing. Why not just choose nitila? The general answer is that it is to allow the seder steps to rhyme better. Urchatz, yachatz, rochza, matza, no, nitila, matza doesn't work as well. But the word nitila is in the blessing where we wash our hands. 
Bread, in general, is a metaphor for our involvement in the material world. The Torah invites us or commands us to eat the toil of your hands, to invest only our marginal faculties in the business of earning a living, leaving our choice talents free to pursue more spiritual pursuits. And it insists that all material pursuits be a means to an end, just a vessel to receive God's blessings and a tool to aid us in life's work to bring sanctity and godliness into our world. The word nitila is based on the root word nun tet lamed, meaning to lift or to bear, also the idea of to elevate. That is why we lift our hands while reciting the words al nitila yadayim during the blessing for washing the hands. It is a way of purifying ourselves and preparing ourselves spiritually, just as was done in temple times prior to participating in the sacrificial offerings. This year with the onset of COVID, washing hands in general has become a lot more prevalent in our society. So this year, as we gather at our Seder for Pesach, when we wash our hands, think of the word nitila to lift, to elevate, as we lift our hands, as we try to bring sanctity and godliness into our world and healing as well. May you have a safe and happy and healthy Chag Kasher V'Sameach, happy and healthy Passover. Friends, my name is Yaakov Fruchter. And we've now reached Motzi Matzah and we are ready to eat from this matzah. And as we do, there are three kavanot, three intentions that I have in my mind in keeping with the psukim in the Torah, the verses in the Torah that relate to eating matzah. The first, of course, is that this is lechem oni. This is the bread which demonstrates um, our poverty, our suffering. And especially today, when we know that there are so many people who are food insecure, I eat this matzah remembering our experience of being hungry, starving, not having enough, not being cared for, and use this moment to commit to trying to help others who need food today. Just as we say halachmania, and we welcome all those who need to come in to eat and let us actually help, find a way to help people this year. Number two, I'm remembering when I look at this matzah that just as it was eaten with the korban as a part of the celebration of Pesach, that I'm able to celebrate in this moment. I am I'm in my home with wine, with good food, with all the things that I need to have the Seder. And even though it's still different, I am celebrating this year in this moment. And finally, the third is that the, a reason given for why we had matzah, why they ate matzah on their way out, is why? Because they didn't have enough time, of course. We all know because they didn't have enough time for the matzah, for the bread to rise. But the truth is, they knew. The Torah tells them, get ready, because on this day, you are going to go. God tells them what to do. So why weren't they ready? Shouldn't they have been ready? Shouldn't their fruit, bread already be ready? And so one of the reasons given when we read the section on matzah is that it says that they were the geula, that sense of redemption, the belief that life was going to be different, that they were going to be free, wasn't there yet. Until the exact moment that God said, that Hashem said to them, go, be free, they weren't ready for it. They needed to be in that moment. And I know right now we still feel cooped up, but it's coming. We're getting to this point where this new sense of freedom will come, and we have to prepare ourselves for it. So until then, we might not feel perfectly ourselves. And just like this matzah, we're going to remain humble and we're going to remain grateful and know that very soon we are going to be able to celebrate Pesach once again the way we absolutely want to. Chag Kashev You should have a beautiful Pesach and feel all the freedom that we are able to at this moment. Chag Sameach, everybody. 
I'm Daniel Silverman, Director of Education at Beth Sedek, and I'm here to talk to you about Maror! That highlight of the song of the Orders of the Seder, but a part of the Seder that many of us probably want to get through very, very quickly. Um, Maror is the located right after we've eaten the matzah at the Seder, that first moment of um, biting that special food, and it's right before we're actually getting to dinner. And it's a, a moment that people want to seem to rush through a little bit, also because you're eating something that's not terribly pleasant. So whether your maror looks like this, romaine lettuce, or some other sort of bitter um, leafy green, or your maror might look like this, right, horseradish, or the horseradish root, the white piece that's a chunk, it's really, really quick. It's one bracha, it's one blessing. And then we pop it in our mouth, and then we do korech, and then we're right on to dinner. And sometimes maror really loses the, the focus um, that some of the other symbols and foods of the Seder tend to have. Right? It's not the matzah, it's not the charoset, which we sometimes put on it, it's not the four cups of wine. And we don't really spend much time talking about it either, other than in that short section at the end of Magid. But maror is something really, really critical to what the Seder is all about. If the Seder is about us celebrating our freedom, then we need to be reminded of what our life was like before we experienced that freedom. Freedom is great, but if you don't have anything to compare to that was a moment where you were less free than you are now, then it's very difficult to appreciate why the moment that you are in is that much more amazing than the moment that you had been in before. So maror is our reminder of the difficulty, of the bitterness, of the harshness of the life of a slave. And as much as a seder is really focused on looking forward and trying to find the celebration of now being free, we need to keep coming back to those points of reminder of the difficulty. It's the salt water during karpas, it's the maror, it's matzah and the afikoman, it's these little hints amidst the celebration of freedom that help ground us in remembering that the things that we have now are better than the circumstances we were in before. And as we all come to celebrate this second Pesach during COVID-19, I hope that we can look to last year's Pesach and come to an appreciation of how things are different and how things are better. Maybe some people around your table, your virtual table or your real table have received their vaccines. Certainly all of us are more aware and comfortable and while still scared, well, we're more knowledgeable about what's going on in the world than we were a year ago. Our maror, even though we're sitting and eating it, probably in most ways doesn't taste as bitter as the maror of last year. For others, it might be more bitter. There might be people missing around the table. We might be in a circumstance of a year now where life has been extremely difficult and people have experienced economic loss and challenges to mental and physical health and emotional well-being. And so when we eat that maror this year, maybe you're thinking about how bitter it has been. And we're hoping for the Shana Haba'a, that in the next year, the maror will be a reminder of a bitter past. And only that, not a reminder of the bitter present. So as you're eating your maror, whatever it may be, I hope that it helps ground all of us in what a Seder experience is about. Remembering the difficulty and the harshness and the challenge and celebrating whatever amount of freedom we have that has moved us past that. Chag Sameach to everybody. Hi, I'm Aviva and I'm the Beth Sedek artist in residence. And today I began preparations for Pesach. I opened up my Haggadah and out fell a pile of matzah crumbs. That made me think about all of the sourdough that everybody's been making and how in fact, Matzah is really the perfect bread. It's very simple, humble, not puffed up. And then I thought about the various ways matzah is uh, spoken of and that we use in the Haggadah. And that made me think of the Pesach sandwich, Korach. Korach is the section in the Haggadah and the Seder that comes before Shulchan Orach, the big meal. What is Korach? Well, we make the sandwich, which I'll tell you about, and it, then we recite, Zecher Lemikdash Kehillel. This is a reminder of the temple, but also a reminder of the practice of Hillel. While the temple was in existence, Hillel would make a sandwich, Korach, binder, wrap. Maybe it was more like a wrap, I don't know, of the Pasach offering, 
the paschal lamb, with matzah and maror, the bitter herb, and eat all three together. And Hillel would do this in fulfillment of what is in Torah, al matzot umirorim yochluhu. Um, matzot and bitter herbs, you should eat it. It, the paschal lamb. And Hillel was really smart because he thought, well, why eat, eat these things separately? You could just kind of mash them up and then they'll be like, easier to put in your mouth. Very practical sandwich. Now, no temple, no paschal lamb. Matzah, third matzah, some horseradish, and then like smushed together. But a little secret that in my family, some people, not to be named, take more than an olive size, but like a dollop of haroset and put it in the sandwich with the maror, close the matzah and say the paragraph and then eat. Why haroset? Well, why not? Because it's sweet and sweet and bitter go together. And this is where we begin my bracha for you, my blessing for you for Pesach. May you always see the sweet with the bitter and um, also, here is what we may call now my Pesach cactus and it's blossoming specially. So I want to wish you um, a bright and a joyous, an ease filled, a healthy Chag Aviv Sameach. Happy Pesach. Connections between Purim and Pesach in song and dress. Some people have the tradition of connecting Purim to Pesach by chanting the last verse of the Megillah to the most popular tune of Adir Hu. Ki Mordechai HaYehudi Mishneh LaMelech HaChashvei Rosh VeGadol HaYehudim VeRatzu Ilerov Echav Doresh Tov Liamo, Vidover Shalom Lechol Zaro, Adir Hu, Adir Hu, Yivne Veto Bekarov, Bim Hera, Bim Hera, Viamenu Bekarov, El Bene, El Bene, Bene Vetech Bekarov. Others have the custom of connecting Purim to Pesach by singing Kadesh Urchatz to the Purim song Chag Purim. Chag Purim, Chag Purim, Chag Gadol HaYehudim, Masechot, Rashanim, Shirim, Verikudim. Kadesh Urchatz, Karpas Yachatz, Magid Rochza, Motzi Matza. Maror korech shulchan orech tzafun barech halel nirza. Among the Svartic and Oriental Jews, Purim is connected to Pesach by dressing up. Members of the family dress up as if they had just left Egypt. Some family members ask formal questions, and the one playing the wandering Jew explains that he has left Egypt and is on his way to Jerusalem. These ceremonies varied in their details. They have been documented in a study by Rabbi David Golinkin of the Schechter Institute. Central to most of them is wrapping matzah in a bundle, slinging it over one's shoulders, and when asked, why are you doing this, answering, so did our ancestors when they left Egypt in haste. Although these customs were widespread in almost all of the Oriental lands, they are surprisingly first mentioned in Jewish-German sources and are documented in Ashkenazic Poland in the 16th century and in Germany and Hungary in the 20th century. They are a far cry from those of us who grew up in homes of Polish and Lithuanian extraction, where attending a Seder meant attending shul on the first evening in formal wear and retaining those clothes upon returning home. Many of you have or remember a shulchan orech, a festive meal that is also formal and solemn. Intermingling the melodies and dress of Purim is a playful way of expressing a more scholarly attitude which begs us to link these two stories of redemption 
one to another. I urge you to examine the narratives and look for those connections. Chag kasher v'sameach. Hi friends, Chag Sameach. This is Sylvie from Beth Tzedek, and it's time for Tzafun, the part where we find the Afikomen. So join me in playing a fun trivia game to find the Afikomen together. Feel free to play along and follow the trail of matzah crumbs to find the Afikomen with me. First question, during what month is the holiday of Passover? It's Nissan, you're right. And here are some matzah crumbs to lead us to the next question. What animal did the Israelites sacrifice for Passover? Correct, a lamb. And let's keep following the crumbs. What does the word Seder mean? The answer is order. Correct. Which is not one of the four children? Yes, the answer is tired. Let's follow those matzah crumbs. Next question. What are the name of Moses' sons? Gershom and Eliezer. Correct. What was the eighth plague? Correct. Locusts. I think we've got one more question until we can find the Afikomen. Which Seder plate item represents the mortar that the Israelites used to build storehouses in Egypt? Carosa, you're right! And we found the Afikomen! Thank you so much for finding the Afikomen with me. Chag Sameach! Chag Sameach, Beth Tzedek. As we reach Barech, this point in the Seder after the meal, I hope our souls and stomachs are full of food and feelings of celebration, of freedom and liberation, perhaps something like our ancestors felt so long ago. In a year that could have been so easy to just go through the motions and, and check the boxes of what we needed to do, I'm impressed and proud of myself and my family and of our whole community for continuing to push ourselves to grow, to learn, and to be better in so many ways. I think this is related to how Jewish tradition teaches us to bless both before and after a meal so that we can't just eat and, and finish the meal and go right back to our normal lives. That we're, we're, we're forced, we're invited, perhaps, uh, to sit and contemplate and 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 discuss what we're grateful for. This reminds me of something my friend and teacher, Rabbi Jordan Bronig, wrote a few years ago. He said, What greater service is there than letting go of this newly found freedom, our miraculous ability to get up and go, and instead to make the choice, full-bellied, to pick up another glass and give thanks for that which just was. And so for the rest of this Pesach and the rest of this year and moving forward, I hope we all can wake up every morning inspired and amazed by what's out there, grateful for the possibilities of what is and what could be, and that we too can make the choice, full valued, to give thanks. Chag Sameach, and I'm looking forward to seeing you all soon. Hi, I'm Lara Rodin, and I'm Beth Tzedek's Tannenbaum Fellow this year. It is such a treat to be here learning with you about the second last step in the Pesach Seder, Hallel. Hallel comes from the word to praise, like hallelujah. It's an act of gratitude, of awe. It's a profound moment of communal happiness. We sing Hallel every year at Pesach at our Passover Seders, and actually also on other joyous moments throughout the year, like Simchat Torah, Sukkot, and even on the first day of every month, Rosh Chodesh. But Halal on the Seder night is a little bit different. It's not like any other old Halal. 
We sing Hallel seated at the Passover Seder versus standing up. We say it at night versus during the day. And we take a break in the middle. Now my teacher, Tovalea Nachmani from Pardis Institute of Jewish Studies in Jerusalem, tells us that the Jerusalem Talmud claims that Hallel is not recited at Passover like it is on any other time during the year, but rather it is belted out in the kind of song which suits a miraculous moment of reclaiming our lives after a difficult experience. The first ever Hallel in history was sung when the Jewish people escaped from Egypt after they had crossed the threshold of the sea which parted, when they sang Shirat Hayam. Now that is a moment of miraculous reclamation and redemption. We sing one of the Tehillim, one of the Psalms in Hallel says, Min hametar karati yah anani bamer from a narrow place, I cried out, God, and he answered me from a divine, wide place. Now, more relevant perhaps this year than ever, do we feel this narrow place, this place of constriction. We're coming out. We're seeing the light at the end of the tunnel on a year of constriction and narrowness. And our Mishnah in Pesachim, as we all know really well, tells us, Bechol dor vador. Chayav adam lirot et asmo ke'ilu hu yasami mitraim. In every generation, a person has to see themselves as if they personally left Egypt. Mitraim, the Hebrew word for Egypt, has the root meitzar, this root for narrow place, this narrow place that we sing of in our halal. And so I want to ask us, I want us to ask ourselves, what's your Egypt? What's my Egypt? What are the narrow places that I need to leave? What's keeping me enslaved? And then, how can I meet myself? How can I meet this Egypt, this place of narrowness and constriction with divine expansiveness in order to become more liberated? Chag Pesach Sameach. Cantor Morris Soberman, Zichrono Libracha, passed away on the first night of Pesach in 1999 as most of us were seated at the Seder. He brought to Beth Zedek many traditions. One particular tradition from his time at the Hevra Shas congregation on Cecil Street was the singing of Chasal Seder Pesach between Mincha and Mariv on the concluding evening of the festival. In the 22 years since his passing, this tradition has continued, led by his students, most notably Howard Black and Dr. Stephen Tanney. Since we cannot meet in person this year to sing together, we leave you with the recording of Cantor Soberman singing this liturgical poem that most of us are familiar with. To commemorate Cantor Soberman, please subscribe to his son Alan's world premiere of Searching for My Voice, available through the Bethsetic website. And please join us on Thursday evening, April 1st at 7.45 p.m. for the program a musical tradition, remembering and celebrating Cantor Morris Soberman. Chag Kasher V'Sameach. Part is for Passover in the Haggadah, which is called Chasal. Chasal Shidur Pesach Kilevato Kichol Mishpato Vechukato, Kasher Zachinu, Esaderoto, Kain and Nizke, Lasoto, Kasal, Sidor Petsa, Kilevato, Kichol Mishpato, Vechukato, Sher Zachinu, Esaderoto, Gain in his care, last all talk. Was all sure he may own a coming to Aladad Nimana. The Carola in the day Hana to do him the Zion. Marina, you repeated a few times. 
and at the extreme end you end it. Shalom.